you see me? Yeah, yep, I can. Okay, so I've known Jason, I don't know, not a long time, a couple of years, but I respect what he's doing. And part of what I want to cover in this notion is the alternative gallery, or the gallery without a physical space, or the gallery that is not necessarily following the historic path, but more like creating its own path, which I think a lot of artists are doing also. I mean, I think it's really wise to pay attention to the antecedents, to what other artists have done before you, and then figure out what works for you, and either do what they did or not. You know, and I think Jason's taken a look at that, but I don't know this for sure, so I want to discuss these things. And like I seem to always like to begin, Jason, how did, where did you go to high school? So I actually grew up around this area. I went to high school out in Freeport, which is. Well, you're in the northern, northern well, I'm sorry, I'm still on out. Well, it's a little in, small town. In the Chicago, Chicago. greater Chicago area. Yeah, yeah. But it was a really small little farming community. So I went to were you interested? In, were you interested in art when you were in high school? Uh, I studied a, a bit of art. I did some ceramics, I did some painting, but I wasn't fully involved with the art world at that point. I really enjoyed it, but I didn't feel that I was that artistic. My father works in a factory. He has his whole life, but he's an amazing artist. Um, amazing drawer, to draw anything. Had us drawing since we were little kids. Um, always showing us how to draw, but he had to raise a family. He was a father young, so. He went that route. I learned a bit of art from him, but it wasn't really until I got to college that I started to see potential in art, potential with myself and with a career. In college, so, did you think you wanted to be an artist, or were you more interested in other facets of the art world? I think I was, I think I was interested in the whole aura of art, about being with the artistic people, creating the work, studying it, being at that part of the campus where all the artists were hanging out and doing all the artistic things, that to me was what kind of drew me into it. So after high school, I went to Illinois State for a bit, and I started studying every type of art from graphic arts to painting to ceramic, um, kind of jumping around with everything, and I couldn't really figure out what I was the best at or what that I would want to pursue my lifelong with. So I went to Montana and I escaped everything, stopped doing all types of art and just lived in that environment for a few years. So I got back to school at University of Montana and that's where I really dove in and I received a BFA from there. And so, what? Fine I was, art? I was in ceramics. Bachelor okay. of Fine Arts and Ceramics. So it was through that process that I started studying, I started learning about the arts, I started participating, started having the little mini shows at the local galleries and the art school. And it kind of set the platform to this huge adventure. I graduated later, so I graduated in 2002, so I've been out of school for about 10 years. I'm 38, but um, since then it's been a whirlwind to get to this point. It's been for me, it's been super exciting. I mean, it's just been nonstop. I feel like great things that have happened. So after school, after I graduated, I received a residency in Denmark. So I traveled to Europe. It was my first experience to get to go overseas and see the art world, to go and live amongst the community, creating work. And then also I was able to travel for about a month and a half to see Berlin, to see Rome, to see you know all these amazing places, Paris, to see all the museums, and this that was for somebody like me from a small city in the Midwest, you know, crucial. I mean, I think it's really hard to create work passionately and with knowledge if you've never seen the David and if you've never seen the Louvre and if you've never seen these things to see what the people did in the past. Are you still making art? I am. I make. Uh, I still make pots, but I don't. I don't participate hugely as having shows and sending work out and things like that because now I have a business that I really need to focus on, and I just don't feel like I can give enough energy to produce the best quality work possible to feature my work in galleries. I still do, and I still sell work, but I understand. I know exactly what you mean. How did you go from 
being an artist to having a business? Was it conscious? Or did it just uh, happen? No, what happened? So when I got back from Denmark, I was over there for a couple of months in Europe, and I came back. And luckily, there was a position in Montana in the town that I was in that they had an art center, and they were looking for a director. So I applied. I received it, and it was held together by grad students that needed a place to make art. And Was this R.D. Bray or something else? I was up in Missoula. It was uh, the Clay Studio in Missoula. So it was focused on ceramics. So what I did is I applied. I got the job. And then I was younger. I had tons of energy. I had connections. You know, I was making all these connections. The Archie Bray Foundation is one of the most important ceramic places in the world. I had a lot of connections there and kept growing those connections. So I started a residency program. So I started entertaining artists from all over the world, from Europe, Australia, a lot of Americans, um, to be with those people and to have them bring their creativity and energy into our place. And at that time, I was more participating. I was having shows. I was in magazines. I was, you know, I had gallery shows, all that stuff. So what I did is I started collecting the work. So I started collecting artists, work from you know, different places. And then what I did is I started a gallery and the best way to collect work is to have a gallery because you get a huge percentage. So I started featuring artists that I personally really enjoyed and I felt that the community would be intrigued by as well. So that Where was, was this? This is in Montana? That was in Missoula. And this was a physical gallery? That was a physical space. So I started showing work. I started collecting pretty heavily from you know, ceramic artists, lots of Archie Bray artists. Uh, ceramics is very important in Montana. It's kind of where contemporary art, ceramic art started about 60 years ago. So I started building this nice collection of work. I ended up, I mean, in 2000, I think it was, I sent some of my ceramic pieces to a producer that was doing a film on Tara Donovan. And Tara Donovan had seen quite a bit of success, but it was not like where she is now. So she sent me a drawing, and so I had that in my collection, and then I took out a loan. I bought a Cy Twombly print. I bought a Richard Serra print, all resourcing my income to collect this artwork. And I did it for different reasons, and I do consulting for the same kind of idea of, like, why you collect art. I really collected art, one, because I loved it. But two, like I really collected it as an investment. I was in my early 30s, and I felt like, you know, the art world's never completely stable. There's always things that can happen. I was enjoying myself, but I felt like I needed something to be secure. I didn't buy a house. I didn't have property. But I felt like I had a great collection that if I ever needed to fall back on something, I had things that were important, you know, resellable and of interest to the public. So I started building this collection and it started growing and I became very confident with the collection and approaching collectors and started dealing quite a bit of work. I had a board, I, this was a nonprofit too. So I had a board member that was a great art collector. I mean, she had pieces by Agnes Martin, Klaus Oldenburg, Richard Tuttle, lots of ceramic arts. And so she was on my board. So we had a show with her collection in my gallery, drew a lot of interest that way. And, um, you know, having that gallery, I learned how to hang work. I learned how to collect work. I learned how to, I mean, you know, as much as you, in the beginning you can learn, but how to entertain collectors and to draw people in and to make beautiful images and postcards and things like that. So <clears throat> that was a nonprofit. So you also learn a lot about asking a lot about getting grants, a lot about funding these residencies for other artists, getting your name out there to build the business, as well as building your own, you know, images and artists. But I felt like I had done what I had set out to do at that point. So I, after four years, I resigned and I moved to Valerie's France and studied, or I didn't study, I did a residency in ceramics where Picasso made all of his ceramics. So I went to a, a small ceramic art center that was similar to the one that I had just been at with a young French Canadian that was the director. He had a small gallery, he had resident artists coming from all over the world. 
and kind of experienced the French version of what was just happening with me in the States. And in the meantime, I had met an Italian woman. After that, I moved to Rome and I lived there for the next three years. And while I was in Rome, we put together a big destination wedding business. So we were, I was also. Was that 2007 or 8 in Rome? That was 2006. <clears throat> so 2006, I moved up to Rome. She was a wedding planner. We started our own business. And for me, I was traveling all over Italy. I was setting up weddings. I was shooting weddings. We were going to see castles and site inspections. So a little bit kind of slowed down during that period, but I learned, you know, things that you could ever imagine. Just being in the Italian culture was beautiful. It really made me see life in a different way. How's your Italian? How's your French? Oh, my French is nowhere. My Italian? Bene. <laughs> you know, si okay, cool. Yeah. But, uh, I mean, I kind of lost quite a bit of it. Anyway, so the reason I started the business I have now, which I'll go into and the name and everything, but the reason I started is because when you have a gallery, what you're doing is you're putting together artists and collectors, and you're the middle person that's featuring all the work, handling all the money, um, doing those situations. So what was happening is I was, you know, driving my Volkswagen through the mountains, the Chianti Mountains in Italy, and people were sending me emails. Ryan was making the work. I used to represent Ryan Mitchell. I still do, but Corbin was buying his work, and then Ryan would make the work. He'd send me pictures. I would send the pictures to Corbin and be like, hey, here's Ryan's work. Corbin would say, how much? I would ask Ryan how much. He would say, and then they'd buy it. So I kept doing that for people because I had these connections, and then I started to get a light bulb and started figuring, if I can do that, I should take a percentage. So the whole concept of my business now, it's called the Nebica Project, is basically, uh, it's a partnership. It's a partnership between the artists I represent, the collectors that are selling work through me, and galleries that are selling their inventory through me. I find the people to buy it, or the places, the mu museums, you know, collectors, wherever in the world that wants to buy it, and then I take a percentage. So most things physically aren't in my possession, most things are under contract, and um, I move it from A to B. And so the reason I called it the Nebica project, Nebica in Italian means it snows. So it's a, it's a project that, um, you know, it's, the idea was to start something small, to have a handful of artists that I represent, work with some galleries, things like that with their inventory and snowballed into something bigger and bigger and bigger and precipitated into this big business that benefits myself, benefits the collectors, and benefits the artists. So that's where the term Nebica comes. And it did, I mean, it started with, I think, I launched it in March 2008, and I had a business plan for it. I was researching it for about a year prior to that, and I launched it in March 2008, and um, I think I had about five artists that I contacted that I had already known, that I had already represented, and then some resale work, things like that. And now I have probably about 21 artists. I have, I mean, I work with Pace in New York, anything that they have in their inventory from Kiki Smith, Klaus Oldenburg, Farrah Donovan can go on my website. I work with other galleries. I work with collectors. And what you see on the website is, things that you can click on and see, but what I have here on my computer of inventory is huge. I mean, there's so many people that tell me, like, I don't want the piece up there, but if somebody's interested, let's talk about it. So what I always ask people is to go through the Nebica Project and send me a wish list. Like, whatever they're interested in collecting, you know, it's my job to kind of find that. And then there's other parts. Consulting, I work with artists which is probably, is this a collector group or an artist group? Artists, only artists. Okay. So what I do is consult with artists um, about, you know, designing this whole web presence where, you know, you can show your work, you can feature your work. The reason that the Nebica Project works so strong or so well is if you look up a lot of these artists or look up, you know, 
certain keywords, the Nebuka project comes up. We put this, you know, in beta in 2007. I worked with a gentleman that I went to high school with that started web design right out of high school. And he really taught me a lot about search engine optimization. Um, and it's so key. I mean, there's so many people that have websites as artists that don't put a lot of stock in it. But if people can randomly come to your website, and I can't even tell you how many times a month somebody comes to me and says, oh, I saw your website. I'd like to apply for representation. Or, you know, collectors coming that I have no idea who they are, and they just stumbled upon my website, and they're looking for a Tara Donovan sculpture. So it's a pretty powerful site. And what I do is I work with artists. I kind of help them with that. And then also about the whole process, just like Alan was talking, there's a lot of things that are crucial. I mean, you have to be confident about your work. You have to have a presence in the community. You have to be at, you know, you have to work. You have to work and go to all the galleries. You have to introduce yourself. And unfortunately, I think a lot of artists feel like if they're true to their work, that somebody else can just do it for them, the marketing, the business. And sometimes people can, but for the most part, they really have to be out there hustling. How do you find your artists? How do they? How do these relationships grow? So what I do is I'm on the computer all day. Now that I have, you know, iPhones, everybody has iPhones. We're constantly on the web. We're constantly doing things. I'm always looking for art. I mean, I'm always looking for the next great artist. I just found uh, Montgomery Perry Smith, Chicago artist, that to see his work is just mind-blowing. I think he's one of the best artists coming out of art school a couple of years ago. He's a local Chicago guy, and his work is outstanding. So I don't represent him, but I just sold one of his pieces. I have a collector that came to town from Bali. I said, you got to meet this guy. You got to see his work. We went to his studio. And the guy bought a piece. So we made the connection, and hopefully we can do more in the future. But for the most part, it's artists that I've had. People submit, you know, and I look. I watch the Internet. I see things. And they don't have to be Chicago at all. I only represent two artists in Chicago. Now, how many artists do you work with, and how many artists do you represent? I, how do, what, what, I, define the terms. So what I do is I represent the artist, but I don't exclusively represent any artist. It's just something I feel like if, if they have other opportunities to show their work, to present their work, that's fine. So I represent about 21 artists. Montgomery is the only new person that I've reached out to that we've sold work, but we haven't actually talked about representation. Do you ever get tempted to do physical exhibits? All the time. So, and? So when I started the business plan, the business plan was to set up the whole online business and then do, you know, SOFA Chicago every year, do something at uh, other conferences, maybe Art Chicago, things like that. So what I did is during SOFA, SOFA Chicago 2008, when I started the business, I came back from Rome and I came to Chicago and I set up a big sculpture, pottery, ceramic show for the Archie Bray Foundation in a warehouse space in Chicago, not actually at SOFA, but, you know, drew the people that were in the city, the population that was interested, and kind of drew them over to my space during the weekend event, which was great. It worked fine, picked up collectors, sold lots of work. Um, it was a success, and I had planned on doing that more, but right now a lot of things are working online that i haven't actually went physical again but at this point right now i'm really looking to go to a physical maybe pop-up space for a couple months things like that because it is important to actually see the work and it's a big question that everybody asks me like is it important that people cannot see this work physically so basically the answer to that is that well, there's two answers. One, I provide complete imagery. It's not just a picture of a sculpture. It's always front, back, bottom, side, detail. So they can really get a glimpse of everything. But it's also having just 
quality work. Like I feel everything that on my website is just quality and a lot of the resale work, whether it's the Klaus Oldenburgs or the old Cy Twombly print, I mean, those are all pieces that are desirable. Like people are really searching for those pieces because they're very rare pieces. And so I think just having images of it, people know that piece especially if it's an edition or if it's in catalogs, things like that. So I seek out those pieces as well. You could do pop-up places in uh, anywhere in the world. I mean, I mean, you might want to go to where you think the, the audience is. Right. Yeah, and I mean, Chicago is a great place. I would love to get some more things going. But, yeah, you could go anywhere. It's just for me, I like to be more secure that that population will come to that pop-up space because – I feel like I'm really busy and I feel like I have to spend a lot of time working with my artists, promoting my artist's work and making money for myself that I can't just take a two month hiatus and set something up and hope that I'll work. You know, it's, you know, I need to have it more secure. Are you pretty much a one man band? Are you doing all this yourself? You don't have a partner per se or somebody helping you with a gallery? All me. <laughs> Do you participate in art fairs? I don't yet. I haven't yet, and I've I've really wanted to. It's just I haven't felt like the time was right yet. You know, I'd like Are you to applied? Have... I mean, I know some art fairs turn down. I, I would consider you a virtual gallery. Yeah. And I know that some art fairs turn down virtual galleries, and some are comfortable having virtual galleries. Yeah. Have you any experience with applying and being rejected just because you don't have a space? No, I haven't even applied. But... You know, it's something I'd really like to do. But then again, it's like it's a business that's four years old. I think we've had a lot of or I've had a lot of success. My artists have had a lot of success, and we've resaled a lot of work. That's been pretty important. Um, so I feel like you know maybe the time's not ready. It's not right right now. Do you feel like you you're capable of working with more artists than you do currently? I think this is a pretty good number, but I always welcome submissions. I mean, I get submissions probably, you know, five, six, ten, you know, every couple of weeks. The thing is, is, like, a lot of people see it because they have such a web presence and I'm associated with different web art groups and stuff. But a lot of the submissions come from third world countries. A lot of desperate artists or you know, they send me images and they talk about how they can't get represent representation in Sri Lanka and, uh, Croatia and things like that and you know I'm passionate and I'm passionate about working with artists and make great work going that far away if I don't know the person is a little difficult so what I do is I start communicating with them skyping with them things like that and then watching their career so they constantly try to keep me updated on what's going on with them so hopefully in the future we could do something but as for you you asked Go ahead, I'm sorry. one person uh, show. So basically, one, I have tried to hire out, but it hasn't worked so well. I mean, I would really like a couple partners, one on the East Coast, one on the West Coast. But I haven't had a lot of like-minded people that try, wanted to come in with this organization. And also, I really feel like it's a partnership. I mean, if my artists are doing great work, they're working for me. If I'm out selling their work, marketing their work, making postcards, last and tomorrow is the new show starting the Nebica project, like I'm working. So we have this huge amount of people I think that really work with us. Do you do shows per se online? Do you change have a rotating exhibits? I do, about, I do about one online show uh a month. So it usually works out, usually the first Tuesday of the month. This one got postponed a week, so I have a, a sculptor, potter, Daniel Bryan Evans, is showing tomorrow morning. He, uh, he was the first show I ever had when I had a gallery space in Montana, and now 10 years later I'm featuring a new body of work. So, And most of the time the work stays with them under contract. And the way that I work it is we work on a contract, they have the work, they ship it once it sells. Um, they're reimbursed for shipping, packing, all that stuff. But once it arrives, that's when they get paid. 
So the way that it works too for the artists, especially if they're sculptors making large pieces, is that they don't have to resource all that money and pay all that money to ship to galleries. You know, they host it online and they're free to show it, you know, to other people. And if it sells, then, you know, they let me know and I take it off my website. How many um, artists, I mean, so you have the, 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 you know, the famous artists, which is, I'll, I'll, let's separate those away. Right. And let's deal with, you know, the more hands-on kinds of relationships. How many of artists, how many artists fall into that category? I think right now I have about 21. I, have, I think there's about 21 on my website. And then there's a handful that I love their work, but we haven't worked out an actual contract. So if somebody comes to me and they have a certain type of work that they're looking for, I can introduce them to that artist or that artist's work and try to sell it. But their names aren't featured on the website. Yeah. I need to segue here because I know some of the artists that you work with and everybody thinks really, really highly of you and it's really complimentary. You know, I mean, an awful lot of, yeah, an awful lot of galleries, you know, physical galleries don't have as many artists who are as positive about their gallery as these folks are with you. Um, I need to ask you a delicate question. Sure. I mean, most physical galleries have a 50-50 split, some of which is justified because they're paying rent. Right. Um, what do you do? So what I do is resale is a different story. So resale I do. A right. With my artists, all the artists that I represent that currently hold the work, um, I take 35%. When it's an artist that sends the work to me and I store it or I hold it in my condo and I take all the photos and I put it online, then I take 50-50. So I feel that for that extra 15% that I don't take is for their work and effort to take the picture. Sure and the pictures. And now that's all getting easier. I mean, you can take beautiful pictures without the huge light boxes and all that stuff and Photoshop. And you can also, you know, post everything on Dropbox and send a link. And it's it's really gotten a lot easier. But I feel like they deserve <laughs> a little bit more. And I also come from the old school where I make work, I send stuff to galleries and they take 50% after I ship it and, you know, pay for boxing and peanuts and shipping and they take 50% and I get to check and stuff. I'm, and, but I'm on both sides. I mean, I also understand why the galleries do it. But I like to give a little bit more. Do you actually work with any of these third world artists that you hear from? Uh, not yet. Are all of your artists in the United, of the 21, are they all in the U.S.? Uh, no. I have, an Where artist, else? I have an artist in Australia, Jules, which is a painter. I have an artist in Iceland. Rebecca Guslov's daughter, she's a photographer, hugely popular photographer. Um, um, is that a problem shipping internationally for these artists? Is it what? A problem to ship internationally. Not really. We've never had any problems. I mean, it's kind of, you know, I talk to them and I ship tons of work and I ship fragile work, but pretty much everything has to be securely packed and everything's insured. So luckily, knock on wood, we haven't had any problems. I had a big breakage of a bunch of work uh, probably about eight months ago, but everything was documented. I mean, I didn't actually physically ship it. Somebody took the work to a UPS store, they shipped it, but I made sure when they walked in, they had pictures of each piece and they had everything insured and everything was taken care of. And since I run a gallery, since I have a business license, since I have all these things, for me to make a claim, it's not very difficult. For the artists that are listening, when you guys insure and you guys ship out, it's so important that you document everything, that you have valuation, professional valuation forms, that you have a professional website. So when these UPS or postals or the UPS or Postal Service, FedEx, all those people look at the claim. The more professional it looks, the more likely likely you'll get your money. No, I feel true. Um, I see somebody raise their hand with a question, and we can ask, you know, I mean, it's time to find out if other people have questions also. 
Um, all right, well, let's do that. Let's move on. Donna, go ahead. Wait, wait. I can't unmute you, Donna. Can you unmute yourself? Go ahead. Hi, Donna. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Um, since you ship, you sell internationally, don't you have to deal with customs? I do. That's so a pain, isn't it? Yeah. And, you know, it's, you have to do duties, things like that. I mean, there's a ways around it. You know, I can't really do that. I mean, you could mark it as a gift and not value it so high and just hope that it makes it there. But ensuring it's the way to go. The hard thing, I used to send a lot of stuff to Italy when I was living there. I was living, I would live there and I would come here for a couple months, go back there. I would send a lot of stuff there and sometimes things would get lost. And it's hard internationally because, you know, Europeans will blame it that it never got past the American borders and the American borders will say that it did get past. And you're kind of in la la land because you can't, it's, it's really difficult to make claims I think overseas. With America, I mean, you live here and there's such strict rules that I've never had problems doing claims. It, it takes a long time. And any of you guys that are shipping art with FedEx, stop. Because FedEx does not pay out for insurance. What they do is you go into FedEx, you take your box or your freight, and you tell them how much it's worth and you pay to insure it for $3,000, $4,000. Then when it breaks, what they do is they pay you by weight. So they pay you a very small amount by weight. I shipped a big ceramic sculpture from was it Denver to Akron to a collector, and he called me. He's just like, yeah, the crate is just demolished. You should see it. And I was like, okay, make sure you get a statement from the driver, take a picture of it, open it immediately, and you only have, I think, a few days to make the claim. Like there's a time-sensitive little issue. And so everything miraculously made it. But when I called FedEx, when I was worried about it, I was like, I have this account. I have a freight account, business account with you guys. Like, how much would I have been paid out? Everything, right? And she's like, no, you, you did take insurance for the value, but you would have got so much per pound, which I think equaled out to, like, $500. Yeah, that can be ridiculous. I mean, I think if you pay for insurance, though, you should be getting whatever amount you're paying right. for. But FedEx doesn't do it. That sucks. But UPS has been, have had difficulty with them too, but I'm, you know, they're also not a bad way to ship. I mean, the, the success rate's pretty high. Yeah, I mean, all of them, and you can watch the reports, you can go on YouTube, they'll all throw boxes around. They'll all have a bad day and, you know, throw something on your porch or whatever. Yep. Yep. Bounce around. The key thing is just double box everything, trade it, make sure it's just packed really well. And most of the places, too, won't even accept a claim if it's not double box. So. Um, do you compare notes with other galleries like yourself that don't have physical spaces and yeah, compare sure. the business practices or anything? Yeah. I mean, with, with me, I'm a pretty honest person, maybe too honest at sometimes. But, I mean, I talk to lots of people, and there's lots of people that have, I mean, I think, the, the trend to online galleries is increasing dramatically. When I started in March 2008, I was in Italy. I came back for two months. I bought a, or got a, a Ocean Beach in San Diego public library card, and I spent every single day in January and February renting books, reading about search engine optimization, web marketing, building small businesses, and there wasn't a whole lot of resource you know, on online businesses or tax, you know, preparations for online businesses. And since then, I mean, there's so many. And even the individual artists, I mean, just them having a website with a price on their piece and a PayPal account, you know, associated to it, that's an online business. Do you, let's talk about that for a moment. And then maybe we have more. I noticed Terry has a question. Other people, I want to hear more questions. What's your opinion about putting, um, sales price on your website so for me here's the situation i have probably a handful of artists that are not overly happy about it you know i have the typical buy now button with the credit card so it goes underneath it and this, usually what i do is during the month that the artist is featured i keep it up once 
their, um, their shows over. The work's still available, but I don't always keep up the buy now buttons. Um, but, you know, a lot of, some of the artists don't care for that. They think it looks gaudy and, you know, things like that. But for me, here's the deal. A lot of people, when you spend, say, $900 or $2,500 on a piece, if I were buying it, I would love to be entertained either through the person that runs the website or at the gallery. But there's so many people that buy work on my website and they click, they buy it now, they run their credit card. I see that they purchased it. I say, you know, this is who I am. I'll send it out within, you know, a few days. Please let me know when it arrives safely. I don't hear anything. I see the tracking number. I see that they signed for it. So, you know, I reach out to them and I ask if, uh, if everything was fine, if the piece is in uh, perfect condition, no response. I reach out to them again in a couple of weeks and ask them if there's anything else they might be interested in, no response. Some people really don't want to converse. They just want to buy it. We live in a buy now reality. I mean, we're always going to eBay to all these places and just buying now. And I think a lot of people are really used to just doing it, buying it, and that's it. And I didn't do that at first. At first I did put prices up, but I always let people contact me and talk about the piece and things like that. But I feel like it works a lot better. And for prices, I mean, I'm a big fan of Artnet, and I'm probably gonna, I just got the application the other day, I'll probably venture into that realm here in the next couple months, but nobody puts prices up on Artnet. And for me, a price is a price. I mean, it's a lot easier for me if they can see the price and they know, because so many people come to me for resale work, they ask if I can get the certain work, I say yes, I'll send it to them, and then they'll say they're interested, what's the price, and I'll give them the price, and they're not interested. So you do all this legwork, and I would rather them just know if they could afford it right then and there, or not. And the thing about my website is we have everything from, you know, $40 T-bowls to, I just sold a piece of thirty-eight thousand. So the range. And I, and I, I'm, I'm going through these. I don't find besides um, Mia, I don't find a whole lot of pieces right. that so are for sale. What I sale. do is I, now I take the buy now buttons off once the show's over. Yeah, yeah I hear you. Here. What about? Um, so I know that these are available. So if somebody bought them, I could get them to them. Yeah, I mean, you have a lot of pieces that are marked sold. Um, how long do you leave sold things up? You think that's a wise strategy? Yeah, I, I I enjoy it. I mean, for me, I, I put the sold signs up. I leave them up so people know that, you know, they've been placed in a collection. And I don't know. I don't really see the strategy of taking it down. The key strategy for me is that every single time the, the Google spiders, the things that shoot out through the Internet, millions and millions of them every second, when they hit a picture or text on your website, it bounces back to Google and says there's something there. And so if they shoot that out again and there's nothing there, your website just went down in ranking. And that's my opinion. I mean, I'm not a master at the search engine optimization, but the, the more pictures you have, the more text, the more relevance you have to, you know, the title of your page, the higher your page ranks. And there's also, you know, if I were to take down every picture, say, of Ryan Mitchell's that I sold, there's people that, you know, post that on Facebook and leave it up there forever. There's people that put that on their blog. So every right. time somebody goes to the blog and they click on it, if I would have taken it down, it would just came up the blank screen like broken link. Yeah, but in five years, you're going to be, con you know, have too much well, congestion. I mean, yeah, yeah. Maybe in 10 years, I'll take everything down. But for the most part, like, I like it. Because, and all my artists make original work. I mean, some do editions, some do series, but for the most part, it's great work, and I love people to come to the website and see it. Is there a particular aesthetic that you think you represent or that you're after? Not really. Okay. I, mean, I, think, I think quality is number one. I'm a huge fan of minimalism. I mean, I love the Richard Serra's. I love the Cy Twombly's. But, you know, there's as, as long as the, the work is just solid and the people are professional, and I feel like the work is really good. I mean, Beth Borjowski, she's in uh, Milwaukee. 
She's an amazing artist. And she does oil works that is something that really I was attracted to when I was younger. It's not something that I'd really buy right now, but her work, seeing it, and I've seen it in person, and I've seen it on the website, it's just outstanding. Okay, cool. Perry, let me unmute you. Ask your question. Uh, yeah. If you're, Perry? if uh, Jason, hi, I'm, caught, I'm here from Minneapolis, Minnesota. Oh, great. Um, if uh, your gallery is is full of uh, your artists, do you have do you refer us to other uh, virtual galleries or recommend other virtual galleries that we could uh, submit to? Yeah, so that goes back to like being the really nice guy. <laughs> I mean, there's there's professional business strategies, and I know that there's some things that I should probably not do. But for me, when I sell a piece. The, some of the most excitement that happens inside of me is that I know that I can pay an artist a nice check. And so if I don't represent the artist and I know about them, or even if I do represent the artist, you know, I definitely refer them to other galleries. And maybe that takes away from a sale, um, you know, and it puts less money in my pocket. But the key thing is that I know that it's helping their career. And when their career is doing better, it's only going to help mine in the end. So yeah, I, I you know, like Niha and Veronica, they're in Chicago, two of the artists I represent. I spend quite a bit of time with them. I mean, I see them quite a bit. I talk to them weekly. I, you know, get you to come to a studio visit. Yeah, I, I constantly I tell like them, that. you know, like when there's grants available, and that's not me being paid to do it, but it's the partnership that I'm in. Besides you, who would you recommend that we employ? <laughs> What's that? I'm sorry. Besides you, who would we inquire for virtual gallery representation? Is there a listing somewhere? I don't. I don't think there's actually like a website focused on what's the virtual gallery. You know, I'm not sure about that, but okay. I'm not either. And I'm not sure even what kind of work you make, but there's, there's. I mean, it depends how computer savvy you are. I know a lot of people aren't, and I just worked with an artist, a friend, and she has a couple of big pieces that are sculptural. She's here in Chicago, and she wanted to, or somebody wants to buy them, but she has no business sense. She hasn't asked for any money. It's been, you know, I think a couple months, and the lady wants them, but she's, I think, a little afraid to shell out five hundred or $5,000. And I talked to her, I was like, you have to be persistent. You don't even have a website, you don't have a business card, like you need that. Like that's such a minimal fee. Verb.com, they develop websites, it's $10 a month. It's beautiful, the templates are amazing, anybody can do it. Business cards, overnight prints, like 500 for 20 bucks. So, you know, it, it's important to get all that out there, which I'm sure you've heard through this course a million times. But anyway, so I mean, if you can search the internet, the, there's many, many galleries out there. And if you guys make great work, let me know because I'm always up for entertaining, you know, great artists. That's and sweet. All right, Alan, your turn. Go ahead. Um, yeah. Um, so I've, I've been focusing a lot the last couple of years on internet, um, getting my presence out there. Um, are there any tricks that you've learned to help? direct traffic, so just the general ones, yeah. sites that you also post on? Basically, so the, the key, well, first of all, blogs are the strongest ways to get attention. They're the most powerful uh, web development on the web. So if you have a blog or if you have a website that's WordPress, things like that, that's the biggest, Google loves it the best because it's always changing, there's tons of information, and it has tons of links going in and out. So you know, to add links to your website, to add friends links, to get your link on all types of websites that are good. I mean, you don't just want to put it on anything, but if you can get it on like really key, you know, different websites, that'll draw a lot of attention to your website. Also, Google Analytics, things like that. Like when I was starting this business, I swear like I was on Google Analytics probably two hours a day. 
Like I was just researching like who's clicking on what, because you can see who's clicking on what page, where they're coming from, what city, what country, and you use it as a marketing strategy. So a ton of people, and obviously it's because I was living there, click on my website from Montana. And as much as everybody like laughs, like, oh, Montana, there's huge collectors in Montana. I mean, there's major works out. I mean, it's a huge state, very little population, but the people in like Whitefish, Missoula, Bozeman, all those places are from major cities with a lot of interest in art that get, get out of the big cities to get into a, a more remote place. So I market out there more. I'll run ads out there. You know, because Google Analytics shows that most people or a lot of people are coming, you know, from there. So keep an eye on that. And that's, you know, free service. You can set it up on your website. It's, you know, just copying a code, putting it into your website, things like that. Uh, what I do, too, a lot is I, you know, I get, like, New York Social, which is an email blast that comes out, like, once a week. Like, what's happening? What's, you know, interesting that's happening in New York? Usually you know, with the high-end social scene or the Hamptons, things like that. And I reach out to those people. I mean, I, I get the email. I see that so-and-so just was at the Chuck Close retrospective or, you know, some big show in New York, and they show a picture of the woman or her husband, and they have the name below it. I Google it. I see who they are, and I reach out to them. And does it work all the time? Not always, but sometimes the people respond. So, oh my God, I love your website. Here's when you say reach out, do you send them an email? Are you picking up the phone? Are you sending them snail mail? What? Usually through email. If I can find, like, say it's a person that has a business and then you go to their business website, then, you know, you just contact them with that. A lot of what I do too is I reach out to interior designers because those people are placing art. You know, do they have, I mean, I don't always know that they have the best eye for art, but they're placing what their clients want. And if their client wants a 60 inch minimalist black and white painting, you know, I reach out to them and tell them that I have an artist that makes that. And do they always respond? Not always, but sometimes they do. And I've met great interior artists. And that's a good. That's way. not a bad strategy for artists to do themselves either. Right. No, that's what I'm saying. Like Chicago has uh, CS Magazine, and every year they come out with CS Interiors. And the whole magazine, first it's free, doesn't cost anything, but the whole magazine is just listings of interior designers, of, you know, architects, of all these people that have an influence on art and can move art and can show art and can talk about art. So I always tell my artists, you know, especially if you're in Chicago, get that magazine and reach out to those people. And the hard thing is, is now everybody's emailing, so spam is huge, so the filters are strict, and, you know, lots of times you'll just bounce into the spam and never be heard of, but it's that one person that, you know, you reach out to them, you have your signature with your, you know, web address, your email address, your phone number, you know, make it look good, and maybe they'll click on it. You know, cool. artist, an artist reached out to me from Minneapolis, and I had never heard of her. She makes steel sculpture, and a friend of mine, Jen Suiyas, is an interior designer <laughs> in Chicago. She's an amazing designer. She has that aesthetic, and I showed her the work. She's like, you know, emailed back in a second. She's like, I love it. I want to use it. So you never know. But if you don't reach out, you know, you'll never have that opportunity. No, it's a, it's a good strategy. Also, with artists, what I tell them is that I tell, or what I tell you guys too, is that set a goal and reach out to maybe three people a week. You know, maybe set aside a half an hour on a Tuesday or an hour on Tuesday and reach out to those people. And then put them in a folder in your email database. So if they contact you, you know, you have the information from the previous email and you can converse with them and hopefully get your work into their realm. True. And or ask them out for tea or coffee or lunch. Yeah. Why? And I recommend that, you know, looking at members of board museum, a museum board members in your community. And, you know, those are people with an established I mean, interest in art. If you go through my iPhone, every museum I go to, they usually have big docent boards or a big yep. thank you fundraiser. This iPhone has about 
50 pictures of all those people and if I have time, I'll re you know, I'll research their name, find out who they are, try to connect with them. Or, you know, if you're connected with people at the local art institute, things like that, you know, ask them. You know, if you see a woman that gives a speech and you know the woman that's in administration, say, hey, Sally, do you know the woman that just gave the speech last night? Is there any way you could maybe introduce me? It's not, it's not an illegal thing. So. You know, you also don't need a really high return on these things. These efforts that Jason's talking about the cost a whole lot. You know, if you make 20 of these inquiries and one person responds, you know, that's only a 5% return, but that's plenty. Right. Um, you know, it could even be much less than that and still be highly worthwhile. Um, there are people who had their hands raised and then their hands went down. Chris, did you want to ask something? Did your question get answered? Uh, yeah, I was... Uh selfishly curious if uh, you represent any stone carvers, Jason. Stone carvers? Yes. I don't right now. Okay. I, I have a guy that I've been talking to quite a bit in Ibeza in Spain, mm -hmm. and he's been conversing and sending me stuff. I don't feel like his work's quite there yet, but, I mean, I wouldn't be opposed to it. I mean, for me, you know, as long as it's really confident work and I'm blown away by it, I'll try to replace it. Okay, good, good. And and that's the key thing with the Nebica project is that, you know, you're not solely with me, so you can, you know, do other things with right. that piece or other pieces, and, you know, it doesn't cost anything. You're not sending that yeah, I've had people, expensive piece to me. Yeah, I've had people tell me I need to, go more into making a statement with my art and what I've always done is just sort of make things that I find attractive. And right. Inspirational. I, I think a statement's really key too, but I mean, it, it kind of depends on how you explain it. You know, right. you have to have an ex yeah. explanation for your pieces that really kind of knocks the socks off of people. I mean, right. you know, right. otherwise you're selling to somebody that's not really that influence in your work and they're not going to talk that much about your work to your friends mm -hmm. it's the people like i have montgomery's piece here you know the collectors in bali i'm going to work on getting it to a friend of his that's going to take care of it for a while but it's outstanding anybody that comes to my condo i'm just like look at this piece you know i have tara donovan on the wall i have an agnes martin print and people come over for dinner parties and they might not even be interested in art at all and they're just like that Agnes Martin is so boring it's gray and has these little lines but it starts this conversation and I love it like I couldn't right. say enough better things about this piece and so you know that's how the art starts spreading to the community if you make something that you can just explain and you can get out there you know then hopefully those people can keep doing it too and I really highly recommend, as hard as it is for anybody to donate something that they love, that they worked hard to do and paid to do, but if you can get these pieces into local museum auctions, auctions that support hospitals, you know, anything that can be broadcasted, especially if it's online and in a physical space, and then also has a bio about you where you can put your business card, because you know, there's been situations where, you know, somebody will donate something to a local charity that has, you know, highbrow collectors in it. They get the piece, they take it home, it goes on their wall, and it's a conversation piece. Every dinner party, every event. Yeah, yeah. You know, borrow pieces out if you're good enough to do a contract, things like that. Like, let people that have great collections, you know, borrow one of your pieces or rent one of your pieces for a certain amount of time. But you have to get a contract and you have to have it, you know, it's important that you have an attorney look at it okay. because wording is everything. And if you let somebody borrow something and you ask for, a, you know, a contract and it has this much value and if something happens to it, if you word that in the slightest bit in error, you know, you could have just lost your piece and they break it. And you have to make sure if they do break it that they can pay you back. Okay, good to know. But, it, you know, if you have a bunch of pieces in your house, you know, why not loan Great. it out? Great. Or in your studio. I want to add something to what Chris said also, is that I don't think you need to pursue galleries or anything else that are only for 
stone carvers or people that only show sculpture or people that, you know, I think you need to go where there's an aesthetic that resonates, but I don't think it has to be stone carving per se. You know, it could be just it feels right. Yeah. And I don't know too many galleries that are only stone carving. <laughs> no, me neither. I don't know any. No, so. I don't see much out there, and I worry that it's just a dead art. And I'm, uh, I'm No, it's not, man. You're making nice stuff. Yeah, you're doing, it's you're doing good work. Art. I mean, drinking straws are not the coolest thing in the world, but Tara Donovan hired seven people and spent seven days and installed thousands of them, 10 hours a day, and they became the coolest thing in New York City four years ago. Mm. So, I mean, you just have to make carvings that are very, very special and that you can explain. Right, right. Because that's the worst. I mean, you make, I mean, you make something and then somebody asks you, like, what is that all about? And then you shy away and say, nah, I don't really know. I just like to do it. Right. And, I mean, that drives me away quicker than <laughs> Well, that's that's good to know. That's good yeah. advice. I'll, uh, I'll spare yeah. people that, that explanation. Yeah. You uh, tell people from, that? From looking at your website, I get the, the feeling that you, you the aesthetic that you, you strive towards might, might be right up the alley of what I create. Yeah. yeah. So I have a submission uh, button on there. I think it's under about. Just send me some stuff. Okay. Cool. We're running up out of time. And John, your hand has been going up and down and up and down. John, do you want to ask something? Well, at different times I had questions, but one of the questions I have. Um, are you at, John? Is, yeah, um, can you hear me? Yeah, where are you? What city? Where am I? Uh, yeah. Michigan, Ann Arbor. Okay. Um, just the other side of uh, Lake Michigan. Um, but the question, the question is, you've got like Chuck Close and Richard Serra, and you sell stuff for them online. Um, do you actually like buy their stuff from Gemini or something like that, and have them, and and, and that's part of your strategy to drive traffic to your website? Exactly. Yeah. That's so awesome. I mean, part of what you're doing is reselling art, but then also like I, I see you as really a connector beyond even your artists that you work with to other artists and you're driving traffic and then you're trying right. to build relationships with as many people. It comes back to what Paul keeps talking to us about building relationships. Right. And so what I do is, you know, I entertain my artists by telling them like if I'm trying to get an artist or trying to represent an artist, like your name will be amongst all these other people that are you know, very important and accomplished and things like that. But, you know, that's what I do is I go to write auction in Chicago. I buy work. I resell it. I put it online. You know, I work with different – I don't work with Gemini, but, you know, I work with other places that have Chuck Close's work and, you know. So the thing – and you have, to, you have to entertain them as well. I mean, as a gallerist point of view, it's – if, you know, if I can sell that piece for them and I take a percentage, you know, they're still getting a percent and they didn't do anything. It's a smaller percent, but, you know, it's a done deal and they did absolutely nothing. Besides shipping and they'll get reimbursed for that. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's all about partnership, connections. And like I heard Alan say, too, in the previous um, talk that, you know, you got to get out. You know, you got to get to these events and you got to drink that awful wine that every gallery serves now <laughs> and just like mingle, you know? Not, the wine isn't that bad if you haven't lived in France and Italy. Yeah, it's pretty bad. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't think it was that bad, but now, oh my God. <laughs> I, can't, I was just at a, a reception in Chicago and it was unbelievable. But anyway, so you you have to put on that face, you know, it's like, so many times you could have talked to somebody, you didn't, and you go home, you're like, God, that person was there. I should have said something. You know, go up and just be like, I just want to introduce myself. Here's my card. If you want to chat, let's chat. If not, just please have a look at my website. Nobody's going to be like, what an immature thing to do. But if you come up with a great personality and you have a dynamite card, chances are, you know, they're going to view it. And you never know. Also, one more thing I want to say, too, is, for marketing, look into uh, MailChimp and Constant Contact. Those are email email marketing uh, services that you can use to connect to your mailing list, your email list, 
and send out information about shows that you have coming up, what you're doing. You could do, I mean, anything. You do weekly blast, monthly blast, yearly blast. MailChimp is free. Constant Contact is, you know, very inexpensive. It's all, you can write it off on your taxes. And the key thing about that is that every button that you create in your email when you send it out is traceable. So you can see the stats. So I send out, you know, tomorrow, and please everybody go to my contact page and click on and then add your name and you can be on the mailing list. But tomorrow I have a show and I'll add like, this works available by this artist. This is the show that's today. This works still available by this artist. Each one of those buttons are a link. And every time, you know, I have thousands of people on my email list, when they click on it, I can see exactly the person that clicked on that. So if I say, you know, this is the last piece by Beth Kavner Stichter, it's a very important piece, you know, very rare, you know, blah, blah, blah. And if I see that so-and-so clicked on that, then I can also see if she clicked on it again and again and again and again. And then I can reach out to her and be like, oh, I haven't talked to you in quite a while. I have a Beth Kevner sticker. Might you be interested? She's like, my God, I just saw your email and I was just thinking about it. Well, let's talk. Yeah, it shows you the time they click on it too. Yeah, yeah. So it's it's really, really a great source. You have it, Paul? I'm using Mail Machine, which is a new company by the people who you know yeah. host my websites. Yeah. And um, I helped them develop it, and I like it a little bit better, but it's they're all it's the same. more expensive than Constant Contact. I think it's less. The mail Machine is? Oh, okay. Yeah. It was more expensive. Um, anyway, so I think this has been really cool. This is a lot of good information. Do you... In summary, do you want to say anything? I mean, you gave some advice. Do you want to say anything more about what artists should do or shouldn't do in terms of, you know, I think a lot of the artists that you're working with are in a similar place to a lot of the artists in this course. So yeah. that I'm wondering what kind of, you know, if you have any final brilliance you'd like to share. Yeah, I mean, I think there's, I mean, there's so many things I could say. I mean, to try to wrap it up, kind of, I've already said it. I mean, you have to be confident about your work and you have to explain it. And I'm sure Paul's told you that a million times, but it's the way you broadcast everything is that's how the public sees it. And if you're making that connection from A to B and you're not following through and you're not doing it consistently, it's just like a website. You break the link and that link's gone and that link can be gone forever. It can be mended, it can be patched, and it can be, you know, filled later, but you always want to keep those links strong. And it, it's difficult, but, you know, it's, it's the world and you got to keep going for it in the art realm. And it's exciting, and I've seen artists become very successful, and I've seen artists shy away and go to work, you know, at Home Depot and support families. You and me both. What? I agree. Yeah. We've seen that. Jason, I think this has been really good. I respect what you're doing. I think you've got your head screwed on real tight, and, you know, I think you've figured out this art world stuff really nicely, and you're navigating your art and village really well and you're you know i mean you're paying attention to what others have done but you're doing your own thing i think it's you know it's important that artists are aware of the virtual gallery but i think it's also important that artists look to you as a role model for you know establishing and making you know doing your own thing and doing it well and you know that it's a testament to the possibility that you and they all have I really appreciate your um, talking to us tonight and sharing this information. I just unmuted everybody. Alan, um, I'm sorry. Jason, thank you very, very much. Welcome. Thank you. Thanks, Jason. All right. Thanks, Jason. Thanks, everybody. And Chicago folks, we're going to Josh Garber's studio on Wednesday. I'll send you an email tomorrow. Thanks, everybody. Good night. Okay. Bye. 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 Bye.